Good morning. I was, I leaned back and I was joking with those, the young kids there about, or young adults, I should say, sorry, that uh, they should work up a special music for us. And they took me seriously. And then I told them, I said, oh, I'm just kidding. But obviously he didn't think I was kidding. So they went ahead and did it. But thank you very much for that. I've said it before, if I had that much talent, I would want to do it all the time. Amen. You know, back to uh, the prayer that uh, my dad had. He was talking about a haircut. And if you figure in the cost of money and inflation over the years, I'm thinking that a $4 haircut sounds pretty cheap. I don't know if he did the math on what he's paying now, but it's quite a bit more than that. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful Sabbath. We thank you that we can come to your house to worship you in song and in word. Father, I just pray you to have poured out your Holy Spirit upon us and that we may gain a blessing from uh, the, the words and the uh, messages that we hear today. And these things I pray in your name. Amen. There was a, uh, a family was traveling and they were on a family vacation, so they were heading cross country, pulling their camper, a mom and dad and two young girls. And it was getting late in the day and they decided that they needed to pull over and find a place to camp. So they had a campground all spotted out, and they were just hoping and praying that when they got there that there would be room for them to pull their camper in and set up camp for the night. As they, because if there wasn't room, the next camping spot that they found was an hour and a half away, and that would be even later, and they knew that they needed to get the rest. So they pulled into this campground, and not only were they surprised that they found a spot, but there was lots of spots. In fact, there was only one camper left in the campsite and they were actually packing up to leave. And so, and, and rather in kind of a rush too. So the dad pulled in, he backed into a spot, the girls jumped out, they went to go play on the playground equipment, and the dad went over to talk to the other man. And he said, what's, what's going on here? Why is there nobody here? And so the guy proceeded to explain that there had been a group of bikers in the area that were coming in and they came in the night before and they overturned several campers, uh, made a bunch of, bunch of noise, were harassing people and threatening. And so people, for fear, they got out of there. Well, about that same time, a police officer came through strolling the area and he warned them that these bikers were still in the area and that they need to be careful and should probably leave. Well, the mom and dad stood there and talked a little bit and they said, well, you know, if we stay here, you know, we take our chances if they come back. Otherwise, it's a awful long ways to go to find another spot. So they proceeded to set up camp, and it wasn't long, and they heard these, the rumble, the sound of motorcycles. And the girls were scared, and they came, and they ran, and they ran over to the camper, and the mom and dad were over there, and the dad came running over and to met, meet these bikers and asked them what was, what was going on, what they wanted. And they were proceeded to threaten him and, you know, trying to scare him off. All of a sudden, the head biker got this terrified look on his face. And he said, oh, I, I, I'm sorry, we, we must have made a mistake. And he got on his bike and they all jumped on and took off. And it wasn't until the next day, the police officer came back and he said, um, you guys are fine, you're okay. And he says, yeah, we're fine. He said, the bikers showed up, but then they, in a hurry, they left. Well, come to find out, these bikers saw a bunch of armed men, police officers, behind the father and, and mother, and that scared them off, and so they took off. You can think what you want about who they were, but they were angels. Angels disguised as protectants of, of this family. And we've all, I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that we've all probably seen angels, just not knowingly, not knowing that we've seen them. The verse that Olivia read to us in Hebrews 13.2 pretty well sums that up. In 13.2 it says, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. Now, I want to uh, say something first. Brandon is graciously taking on, taking on the responsibility of lining up the preaching schedule. So the weeks that the pastor's not here, Brandon is, is trying to fill those slots. 
And so if anybody has a problem with me being up here, you can take it up with Brandon. But also, if you have a burden of something you want to share, a message you have that God has inspired you with, again, go talk to Brandon. When uh, I decided to do this, I, angels are something that we just don't hear much of. We always hear about God the Father, God the Spirit, and the whole, or, yeah, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the angels never really get mentioned much. But I believe they do, they serve a big role in God's divine purpose for us. And in fact, the Bible thinks that it's pretty relevant because more than 250 times angels are mentioned or referred to in the Bible. And in Revelation alone, they're mentioned more than 80 times. The Hebrew word, malak, and the Greek word, angelos, both mean messenger. So an angel is a messenger. They're a messenger of God. Want the, the slides ready to go there, Fallon? When you think of an angel, what do you normally, what do you normally think of? Go to the top one. Do you think of angels? Is this angels? Maybe if you're a sports fan, this might be what comes to mind. These are angels, the Los Angeles angels. But probably not what first comes to your mind. How about this? Do we think of a small baby with wings? There's some depictions out there. I googled some pictures on the internet and there's a lot of these type of pictures out there. Or how about something more like that? We think of it more in uh, human form with, with mighty wings, very majestic, very powerful. Are angels ordinary people? No, they're not. They're created beings. They're, more, they're, they're not mortal, they're immortal. And just like us, they're, very, they're unique. Each one of them is unique. Would, how, how exciting would it be if all of us were created the same, if we were all it wouldn't be very exciting. You all wouldn't want to look like me, and, and uh, I'm sure maybe the same as otherwise. But there's two classes of, of uh, angels. One is the cherub, or plural is cherubim, which is the previous, how do I go back? Cherubim. So that's more what you think of in the, for a cherub, something with, with wings. Actually, let me go forward. Something like that, with the wings. Um, but that's a cherub. They're the, they're the ones that guarded the, the gates of Eden with a flaming sword. We've heard them referenced before. They're also called the watchers. The seraphim mean burning ones. And this is the best I could find. It's kind of an uh, artist depiction of what it would be like. But six wings with a body like a blowtorch. Now, Deuteronomy tells us that God is like a consuming fire, doesn't it? Maybe these are somewhat close to that, representing God. Turn, if you will, with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. You can remove those, thank you. Chapter 6, starting in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me. For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of, peop of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from the tongs of the altar. They're often seen before God's throne, or they're seen by prophets in vision. Sometimes, you, maybe you've heard um, in Genesis 6 2, it alludes to angels as being the sons of God. Now, some have mistakenly 
there's some theories out there that think that giants came from, that's referring to angels, sons of God, and that they saw the daughters of men, that they were fine, and they procreated with them. But angels are divine creatures. They do not procreate. They are, in fact, asexual, neither being male nor female. They're referred to as male, but, or as men, but they are just of men, like we considered us as men and women, but men as a generality. And if you go back to Genesis, it's actually a long uh, investigation there, but the line of Seth, after Seth, of Seth after Enos, that's when they were referred to sons of God. So it's actually the line of Seth and not angels themselves. Psalms 8.5. I have several, there's several verses. I could go on for the whole time looking up nothing but verses, but I'm just going to look up a few of them. Um, but Psalms 8, verse 5. He's got it there. For you have made him a little lower than the angels and have crowned him with glory and honor. So who is he referring to here? Who is him? That's man. So we're created lower than what the angels are. Peter describes them as being great in power and might. In 2 Kings, verse 19 and 35... Uh, there we go, Second Kings. And it came to pass on a ni certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. How powerful are they? How many angels did this? One angel responsible for killing 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When David sinned in numbering Israel... A single angel went through the land as a plague and killed more than 70,000 men. So the angels are there to do God's bidding. But are all angels good? No, nope. they are not. At one time, all of the angels served God. But you remember, there was a war in heaven. And who was the highest ranking angel? Lucifer. Lucifer was the highest ranking angel. Now, there's some discrepancy. Some say that nearly a third of the angels went with him. Some say closer to half. But there's a lot of angels that went with Satan, that he was so convincing. Is it any wonder that we struggle so much on this earth with sin? We're fighting someone who is much wiser, much smarter, and much more conniving and, and uh, able to convince us of things that are untrue. We're at war. Ephesians tells us, that we're at war with fallen spirits that rebuke God's will and sin. Matthew 25, 41 says, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus is the one saying this. He says, Depart from me. So the devil and his angels are responsible for trying to torment God, trying to torment us. The evil angels. Good and bad angels alike, they are very much real. Don't for one minute think that because we can't see them, because we can't feel them, that they're not there. How many of you have Wi-Fi in your house? We all pretty much do. How about this microphone? Is it, I don't have any wire attached to me. How is the sound getting through? Through the air. We can't see it but we know it's real. We can hear it, we can see it, we can't see it, but we know that it's real. It wouldn't it be nice if God would just destroy Satan and his evil angels? I mean, the angels aren't this, the problem. It's Satan isn't the problem, isn't he? But he's taken them with him. But what good would that be? Does God want us to serve him out of love or out of fear? Out of love. Isn't God on trial? Isn't he being tested? As I said before, some have portrayed the angels as that little cupid with the wings. But angels, actually, by contrast, are very powerful, very mighty. In fact, Matthew 28, verse 3, describes angels' countenance as like lightning and clothing as white as snow. 
So how fast is an angel? Anybody want to guess? How fast is an angel? Quiet crowd today. Well, let's turn to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 14. Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 14. And the living, this is a vision that Ezekiel had. And the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. Is there much as fast as the speed of light? Not much, is there? Heaven's messengers move faster than the speed of light. In fact, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 21, when Daniel was praying to God, God sent a messenger thousands of light years away, and the angel arrived before Daniel was done with his prayer. Is that fast? It's very fast. Angels have bodies, kind of like that last picture or the third picture I showed. They have bodies, they have wings. But unlike us, they are. They are immortal. Long ago, scientists discovered the existence of gamma rays, infrared rays, microwaves, radio waves, and more. So we, we believe that those are there, as we've already discussed. It's not that hard that we would can uh, fathom that there'd be a spiritual realm out there that we can't see as well. So how many angels are there? The Bible is pretty clear or describes a couple instances of how many angels there are. In Matthew, Jesus describes his father as sending 12 legions of angels. That's more than 80,000 angels. In Revelation 5, verse 1, I want to turn there a minute. Revelation 5, verse 1, or verse 11. 5, verse 11. Revelation 5, verse 11. Then I looked. And I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. The Greek, Greek terminology for this indicates that it's an innumerable number, that it can't be counted. How many humans are there living on the planet today? Any guesses? You said how many? I think it's getting closer to nine billion, isn't it? Eight something, eight some billion. That's a lot, but that's a number that we can count. That's a number that we can tally. Here the Bible is describing angels as innumerable. Hebrews 12, verse 22, also says that, counts it as an innumerable number of angels, an innumerable company, company of angels. Turn with me back to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 11. The king of Assyria was making war with Israel. And he was bewildered because every time he tried to attack, his plans were foiled. The enemy knew when he was attacked. And so he asked his leaders, how is it that they always know my, my plans? Who's leaking the information? And they said, no one is. But the words that you speak in your bedroom are known to the prophet Elisha. So the king of Syria sent to go surround Elisha and capture him. And so imagine Elisha is sleeping and his assistant comes to him and he wakes him up. He says, Elisha, Elisha, come and look. We're being surrounded. And as he walks to the window, he's rubbing his eyes and he looks out and here is the king of Assyria, with all of his soldiers surrounding the camp. And he says, um, in verse 14, So then he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of man of God arose, saw that there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots, and the servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So Elisha answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. 
And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So, who were those men? They were angels, weren't they? These are just the good angels. Angels are mighty and majestic, but they are not to be worshipped. They are part of the divine order, but they in themselves are not divine. When, a ma- when an angel appeared to John, John bowed down to worship him, and the angel's response was, Do not do that. Worship only God. The Ten Commandments state it pretty clearly, don't they? How many gods are we to have? One. There is one angel, though, that's demanded worship. Who was he? Satan. Where is he now? He was cast out of heaven, wasn't he? Angels are our partners. They're fellow servants. The angels love to glorify and praise God, much like we do. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Angels are our ministering spirits. When Moses built the sanctuary in the wilderness, angels adorned the temple. They were placed over the ark. Angels were embroidered into the curtains. There were, they were engraved into the walls of the, of the sanctuary or of the temple. They were everywhere, much like they are today. In reality, angels surround God's throne in heaven, waiting for us to do his bidding. We each have a guardian angel, don't we? And do you know that the angels have direct access to God? They're there for us, our protectors. God has given his angels charge over us. We could go on and on and on about the angels and the references to the angels in the Bible. How about the angels who visited Hagar? Lot, that fed Elijah. How about Daniel and the lion's den? Who closed the mouths of the lions? I mean, these are things that God has done, but he sent his angels to do those things. Even when Jesus was fasting for 40 days, an angel came to comfort him. There's a story of a man by the name of John Patton. John Patton was a missionary in the New Hebrides Islands. Him and his wife were there alone, just doing their missionary work. When one night, there was a, a tribe came, they were, they were cannibals, they were a man-eating tribe, and they came to burn them out of their village and to kill them. And they didn't know what to do. They were surrounded, they were way outnumbered. So they just sat in their hut and they prayed all night long, prayed to God that, for his protection. They woke up the morning amazed to see that nothing was burnt and that everything was in place the way it was when they went to bed or when they went into their hut and the men were gone. And it was about a year later when the leader of that tribe actually became, started studying with John Patton and became baptized. And so when he was talking to the leader, he asked him, he says, why, he says, what happened that night? He says, why did, you guys, why did you guys leave? Why did you not follow through with what you came here to do? And the leader looked at him surprised, and he says, well, what are you talking about? He said, you had an army here. He said, no, we didn't have an army. It was just my wife and I, and we were in our tent praying. He says, no. He says, your camp was surrounded by men in shiny armor and flaming swords. God had sent his angels to protect this, young, this family. We're not alone. God didn't put us here on this earth to fight this battle alone. We have access to God. We have access to his Son. The Holy Spirit is to abide with us. But we also have his angels that are there to, cover for, to protect us. Had the heavenly beings watch over us and they guide us into the truth when we stray. You ever notice how sometimes we do things and you can sense that there's someone there watching? Or a near miss in a car accident? Do you think it's possible that somebody could have 
that they're powerful enough, they could have directed the vehicles to not collide. We will not know. Someday, hopefully we'll be able to find out. I'd like to someday personally meet my guardian angel because I know he's protected me from a lot of foolish things that I've done and protected me from harm that could have come my way. Even though we should never worship them, we should certainly thank God for sending his angels to watch over us and to serve us in this fallen world. You know, we think that because Adam and Eve sinned, that we're the ones that are paying the price for this. But what about the angels? Do you think they enjoy this? They had it great in heaven. They had a great time. They just praised God and worshipped Him, and now they're having to suffer the consequences of sin, much like we are. So let's remember that, that we need to always remember I know it was said one time that when we travel in our car, it's always easy for us to use the passenger seat as something to uh, place our things on, maybe place your purse, place your lunch pail, anything on that passenger seat. But I've heard it said once, and I think maybe my, my dad is one that maybe said it, that we should keep that seat open. If we're traveling by ourselves, keep that seat open because Jesus, or maybe we're making room for our guardian angel to travel with us and to provide us safe passage. Let's have our closing hymn.